Well, let's pray as we get into the word. Uh, Father, I lift this time up to you as we, Lord, begin the book of 1 Corinthians and just all the richness that there is in there that you have for us to, to discover about our relationship with you, Lord. So we pray that you take this time, beginning with this week, as, Lord, you do, you just instruct us, Lord, and I pray that in all this you'd be glorified and your people would be edified in Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we're beginning in um, the book of 1 Corinthians. I'm excited uh, about it. Uh, you mean it's been good to be in the book of Acts? It's been good to be there and, you know, get all the history and all of that. But now to get into 1 Corinthians and, and to um, three things that I really discover in the book of 1 Corinthians, one of it, one thing is who we are in Christ. And that's obviously incredibly important. And then, you know, once we discover who we are in Christ, we then look at, well, if because of who I am in Christ, how should I then live? And then related to that, um, how I then relate to other people and how I relate to the Lord. So we'll see those things through our study of 1 Corinthians, but let's begin here by reading the first nine verses. That's what we're going to look at today. As it says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ that you were enriched in everything by him in all utter, utterance and knowledge. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short of no gift eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ who will confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Excuse me, water was down there. Corinth. We've read a little bit about Corinth as we were going through the book of Acts, but, you know, today, obviously, needing a little more in-depth background, Corinth, as you'll see, um, is a Roman colonial city on, the, on an isthmus that connects northern and southern Greece. You can see it there. You might not, I mean, I didn't for a long time realize that Greece had two sections to it. Um, the north being Greece, and then there's the Peloponnese down there at the bottom. Now, it was important to, that, it's important to realize that it was a colonial city, and it was the most important Greek city to the Romans, being the center of commerce and culture. Now, um, Sue, if you can show the other pic, there you go. Now, Corinth was set right on, this, on the southern part of that isthmus where it connected to the Peloponnese. Now, the reason this is important, its location, is ships, when they were sailing around there, they didn't want to go all the way down below Greece to the rough waters. So 
at the time, what they would do is smaller ships, this, and that's four miles wide there on that, that part of the isthmus, and w- smaller ships would sail up there, and they would actually drag them across the land for four miles, you know, on rollers to get them to the other side. This is the uh, gulf, on the left is the gulf of Corinth. They'd drag them into there. But if it was a larger ship, they would just come and dock and they would offload it, carry all the stuff four miles and then reload it on another ship on the other side. Now, Corinth was also the location of what was called, boy, to get these words out, the Ithamian Games. All these T-A-S is is kind of, is kind of rough, but the Ithmian Games, which was kind of a competitive game, or is competitive with the Olympic Games, it's like they were, you know, which one was going to be the best or the, you know, greatest this year or whatever. They'd have the Olympian Games and the Ithmian Games at the same time. Now, the city was also the center of a lot of idolatrous worship. It was the home of the worship of Aphrodite, which, you know, there was a lot of, obviously, uh, sexual aspects in that. And every evening, a thousand women would come down from the temple into the city so so that men could worship the goddess and support the temple. A thousand every evening. Paul entered the city first in 51 AD and stayed and preached and taught there for a year and a half during his second missionary journey, as we saw, as we studied. On his third missionary journey, while he was in Ephesus, Paul received word from the household of a woman named Chloe, who we'll find out about next week, um, about some problems that were going on there. He then received a delegation from the church who wanted understanding of certain theological questions. So as we study, we'll see these issues come up as he addresses them. Now, the problems we see in the Corinthian church are the same problems that we see really in the church today. You know, where people are, it's understanding, it's that understanding of who you are in Christ And then because, you know, when you discover who you are in Christ, then how does it affect your life? How does it affect your attitude about life? How does it affect what's going on at the present? They wanted to be in the church and in the world at the same time, as, again, we'll see as we continue in our studies They wanted to walk after the flesh, and they wanted to walk in the spirit at the same time. I mean, most people are familiar with the fact that the Corinthians, you know, they stressed spiritual gifts. But at the same time, some of them were living immorally. Now... For this reason, they and those who would follow their example today are experiencing a low level of Christian life, not living in all that they can and being all that they can be in Christ. Now, when you try to live in both worlds, you're really not satisfied in either one. So, As Paul will describe through the pages of this epistle, the only way, the only answer to such a situation is to live your life after Jesus and not centered on yourself. So, now in verses 1 through 3, we're going to see, first of all, that we are called in Christ. One of the most, well, the most really important prepositional phrase that you find in the New Testament 
is in Christ or in Jesus or in him because it's talking about our position in him. And the truth is that you're either in him or you're not in him. It means you're in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ or you're not in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. There's no halfway point. It's like saying you're half married. You know, you can't be. So we see here in verse 1 as he starts out that, that he says Paul introduces himself and because of the situation there, he's expressing or reflecting, demonstrating his authority by saying that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. He recognized the calling on his life. You know, it's kind of, there's kind of an interesting problem here with the translation. And both when Paul talks about himself and he, when he talks about the Corinthians, then when, as he addresses them, as he says he's called, as it says in your translation, it's called to be an apostle. Well, the to be, if you'll notice there is in italics, it's not really there. The called isn't really a verb, it's an adjective which really describes who he is. He's a called apostle. And we'll talk about the other aspect of that when we get down to talking about those there. But he, in the introduction of his letter here, he makes this typical introduction. And it is following a, a letter format of the time. So, you know, it has an introduction. He begins by introducing himself. Then he talks about how he, you know, the people he's addressing. Then there's usually a thanksgiving in the letter as well, and then they go on to the content. That's kind of the typical way they wrote letters at the time. Now, at the same time, you know, as he's doing that, he's still, Paul is really creative in introductions. If you haven't noticed, you know, he's, it's like he's saying hello to people, but at the same time, he's telling them, you know, you need to get yourselves right with the Lord. You need to see, you know, hello, but get your life right. <laughs> you know, he's just right there, right away. You see it very upfront as he, I, you know, stresses to them who they are in Christ. He identifies himself as being a called apostle by the will of God. Now, some of the people in Corinth had a hard time with Paul, as we'll see later. You know, we, from the early church, we get some physical descriptions of Paul, you know, not being the greatest looking guy, balding, bent over, you know, squeaky voice sort of thing. You know, we do have some description. Don't know how accurate they are. But at the same time, as I said, the dude's pretty blunt. You know, he was just very straightforward. And he, you know, when you have these people that are trying to be cultural and everything, and, you know, he wasn't really dealing with their cultural, according to their cultural sensitivities, he's telling them, you need to get right with the Lord. Paul knew that he was not an apostle by popular vote, but he was called, but God had called him to be an apostle. God had called him as an apostle. And it's critically important for you to know who you are in Christ, to know what God's called you to be, who he's called you to be in Christ. Because, you know, there's going to be a lot of things that come your way, many challenges that you know, are bound to come. So it's important that we really know that God has called us to be in his kingdom and who he's called us to be. I mean, for myself, you know, I could say, Chris, called a pastor teacher by the will of God. But you all should be able to say, Describe who you are in the same way. What you're doing, whether it be, you know, a husband by the will of God, 
a father by the will of God, a wife, a mother by the will of God, a technician by the will. Whatever you're doing, you should be able to think and know that I, here I am in the will of God doing what I'm doing so there's no better place for me to be than in the will of God. And so that's what Paul's demonstrating there, what he's saying there about himself. Here I am, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ according to the will of God. He was, was responding to the will of God as he ministered and not just listening to people. He saw himself in his ministry as being personally accountable to God. And that's what we each have to do in whatever our situations are, to realize that directly. There would be a lot fewer people falling and pastors falling if they saw themselves personally accountable to God for who they are and what they do. Now, he was also an apostle of Jesus Christ. Not called along with the 12, but equal to the 12. Not called at the same time. In another place, he said, he, he said I was called like one born at a time. Unusual situation, different situation. God called me, but just as he called them. What is it that God has called you to be in the body of Christ? We each have a place. Now, then he introduces this other guy. Oh, there's one another one of those TH words. And Sosthenes, our brother. Sosthenes. Sosthenes, as we remember from studying the book of Acts, was the new ruler of the synagogue in Corinth after Crispus, who was the ruler before, became a Christian, so he couldn't be the ruler of the synagogue in it, there anymore. And, but then what happened is there was, they went before the magistrate there in the city complaining about it, and some of the Romans reacted by beating up Sosthenes, who was the ruler again, of the synagogue. And it becomes obvious after that, it seems to be that he experienced the grace of God and became a believer himself, you know, probably through the witness of Paul. But now we find Paul in Ephesus and Sosthenes asked, as his secretary, or he's the one who's actually writing the, le the letter to the Corinthians as Paul dictates it. Now, we get to us, or we get, first of all, to the church in Corinth, as it says, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. Paul addresses his letter to the church of God, which is in Corinth. Now, the word, now this is really important. There's three different words Paul uses to describe the fact of who they're called out to be or the fact that they are called out. The first one here he uses, he addresses them as the church that is in Corinth. Now, the word for church in Greek is ekklesia, which means those who are called out by someone for a specific purpose. And again, we see that picture of purpose there. Each of us having a purpose. God didn't call you out to be a part of his church just so you could hang out. But everybody has a purpose. Everybody. Now, this wasn't an exclusively Christian term or even a religious term, but it's the one who does the calling that makes a difference. And so as he says here, 
the church was at that Corinth, those who were sanctified in Christ Jesus. So it's the fact that the Lord had called them out and called had chosen them as, as Jesus told the disciples in John chapter 15, you didn't call me or choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Same for each and every one of us. He's called us and appointed us that we should go and bear fruit. Now, Paul continues the thought in his further descriptions of him. Next, he says, those they, that they're sanctified, which means, again, to be set apart for a purpose. When you sanctify something, you know, they talked about the implements in the temple being holy or sanctified. It means to be set apart for a specific purpose. So he's telling them, yes, you're the church. You've been called out. Not only have you been called out, but you've been set apart in Christ Jesus. There's set apart for a specific purpose. Turn with me, if you will, for a, to 1 Thessalonians, to the right there, a few books. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Page 1975. Verses 3 through 8, it reads... For this is the will of God, here's that word again, your sanctification. This is the will of God for your life, that you be set apart for him. That you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion and lust like the Gentiles who do not know God that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this manner because the Lord is the avenger of all such as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. And again, in case you didn't guess, that word for holiness also means to be set apart. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also has given us his Holy Spirit. So, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives after we are saved to make us useful, to set, up, set us apart for him. Now, then, as I said before here, as Paul was called an apostle, then he tells them, well, you're called saints. The word saint here, literally from the Greek word for to be holy, hagios, but it's referring to them as holy ones that's translated for us saints, which again means to be set apart, to be set apart for God. Called apart from that which is common. That which is common, the base sort of things. Now, good example of this, Paul using his example for, with Timothy as he talks about, you know, there's different kind of vessels. You have different kind of vessels in your house, especially back then. They had the cheap stuff, you know, like in, like in your house, like in my house. I'll use that as an example. You know, I have different kind of bowls in my house. We have in a, like a curio cabinet, we have the fancy plates, all of those sort of things. But then, you know, we have the... Typical daily, the Corel stuff, you know, you have in there with the bowls and the plates. You know, not the greatest, but they're for the daily stuff, they're fine. Then, and, but they're a little bit fragile. So then we have the plastic stuff. 
And we even have some of those bowls, you know, with the little straws that come out. So when you're eating cereal, you know, you can get all the milk out of that. We, get, we have some of those. But we have some other type of bowls, too, that I don't eat out of. Those are the dog bowls. <laughs> so I have all of these bowls. So our fancy dinner plates are set apart for special occasions. That's what you are. You're set apart for his purposes. That's why it's not suitable for you to live like the world does. Because God has called you to be his child. And he loves you so incredibly. And you know, what would happen to those nice plates if I could, you know, feed the dog off of them and all of that other stuff? They'll get scratches, they'll get messed up, you know. All of that stuff, what happened to it? Those things are set apart for a special purpose, for a special use. And so this should affect the way that you think about yourself and how you live your life. Do you live as God called you to live in the sense of who you are? Stop listening to what the world tells you you are or what you should be doing. Listen to what he says you are and what you should be doing because of who you are. You ever notice English royalty, the things they don't do? I, I'm more interested in what they don't do than what they do. There's a lot they don't do. You don't expect them, you don't see them out washing their rolls in, the, in front of the Buckingham Palace. You just don't see them doing that because, in a sense, they're called to a different position. And so in the same way, well, the Scripture tells us you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a special possession of God. called us out of darkness into his glorious light. So how are we living that reflects that? Or are we? You see, part of, the, of it is the way we live becomes our witness to the people around us. I love it when you have the picture when Joseph was in Potiphar's house in, in um the book of Genesis and Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him and his response to her was how can one, uh, one such as I do th such a thing he knew who he was yes as a Hebrew but he knew also knew he, who he was as a in his relationship with God so he said how could I do that that's not who I am that makes absolutely no sense So, as we can see, this word here is packed with who we are in Christ. And as this introduction is packed as well with who we are in Christ. He identifies himself as being a called apostle by the will of God. But we're called saints. Now, a saint, we tend to think it through church tradition over the years. We've come to think of it as being the special person who gets canonized by the church or whatever. 
not the biblical use of the word. Every believer in Christ, and that's his point to the Corinthians, every one of you is called a saint, called to be set apart for him. It's not, you see, this is a danger that happens in the church. And I'm, to be honest, this isn't just the Catholic church, but also in Protestantism as well, when people get lifted up to a position, oh, that's the pastor. I don't have to live the way he does because he's the pastor. So he's that holier guy that he might be a saint. You know, he might, you know, have a Superman t-shirt on under his shirt or whatever. But no, we're all called saints. There's that expectation for each and every one of us to be what God's called us to be in him. Now, the common thread between all believers is that we all, as it says here, those who are sanctified and called saints, which in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's what we have in common. And what does the scripture says? Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's what we're talking about. All those who have come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ by calling on his name, him being the only hope for our salvation, as you say, Lord, I'm a sinner. Save me. Save me. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That defines you as a saint. Now, we see in verse 3 that we are called by grace which results in peace. As it says, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What makes the difference between us and the world is that we've received the grace of God. No better than anyone else. I'm not better than anybody on the street out there. It's all because of the grace of God. As Ephesians 2, 8, really going on to verse 10 says, for by grace you've been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we're all saved by grace. And then the 10th verse, always important to have in there as well, for we are his workmanship, literally his poema, his poem, his work of art. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which he's prepared for beforehand that we should walk in them. We're not saved by our works, but we're saved unto good works. It identifies us as who we are. It doesn't make us who we are. And then, as he says, grace and peace. So we experience the grace of God first in order that we might have peace from God. Now, two aspects of peace here. First of all, you have to experience the grace of God first in order to have peace because it's by the grace of God that we have peace with God. And that's where it has to take place first. People are not going to have peace in this world until they have peace with God. So when we have peace with one another, we can then have peace with others. But we first have that peace with God through the cross. so that there's no longer a problem between God and I because he's dealt with my sin through the cross. And now 
I can have peace with others because Jesus has done away with the wall that divides us. Since we all have to come to God in the same way. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18, Paul talks about how, about how he is our peace who has broken down every wall. And he was referring to the situation there that in Christ, that it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, that was the situation at the time, that you come together as one in Christ. In Christ, it doesn't matter what your background is, your ethnicity is, your traditions are, your culture is. We are one in Christ. As Paul said, I believe, to the Galatians, there's no, in him, there's no Jew, Gentile, barbarian, which they called everybody who didn't speak Greek, or Scythian, which is kind of like to the Northeast, you know, doesn't matter. We're all one in Christ. And you see, that's what's critically important these days. We can look at the situation we have today, and we have a very divided country, as we've seen. But the only way it's going to be restored isn't going to be, you know, you, and we see people intentionally trying to divide it. But the only way that can be united is in Christ. It's not going to happen by us just, you know, oh, let's get all these people sitting down around the table. It isn't going to happen. But in Christ, it will happen. In Christ, it's the only way it can happen. And that's why, well, we'll see ultimately... That is simply, it's just going to be when the Lord comes back that this finally takes place. Now, in verses 4 through 8 here, we see that next that we are enriched in Christ, in Jesus. As it says, first of all, here, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you in Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and knowledge. So we're enriched by his grace. The word enriched refers to the wealth that we have as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. The positional standing that we have in Christ all the things we inherit in him. When we think of wealth, we think of all those things that it would take to make us complete. That's typically the way people think these days. You know, oh, if I only had this, my life would be complete. Then when you get that thing, you think of the next thing. Oh, if I only had this, when you just look at it like with technology. I remember, you know, remember back in, the, back in the day when I was in college, my phone, I got, you know, from AT&T, it was a landline, obviously, way back then, date myself, plug it into all, paid $35 for it. Worked perfectly fine. But then you get the next expectation. Then there was the cordless phones. You know, you just have to have a cordless phone. So I can get around the house. I'm not, you know, on the line there. Then you got, started getting the first mobile phones. Remember the ones, you ever watch any of those old like cop shows and they had the phone in the middle of the, of the, the middle console there and they're getting called and they're picking up that phone that's connected to a wire in the middle of... Then, remember the first mobile phone. You know, you thought you were carrying a walkie-talkie or whatever. That big. Now they keep getting smaller and smaller. Now it's gotten to the point of, well, you know, 
How much memory does it have? How fast? You know, do you, do you have the thumbnail idea? Do you have the retina scan? Do you have all? But you've got to have it all now. You know, so it, they increase the things we got to have. The world, that's the difference here. You know, the world's always increasing what you have to have to get along, to be complete in this world. The truth is, the only place that we can find completeness is in Christ. None of those things will satisfy. Turn with me, if you will, to Colossians. Again, a few books. We were in Thessalonians before. It's just before that. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. And Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, For in him dwell, dwells, referring to Christ, dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him. The only way to be complete is to be in Jesus. You're not going to find it anywhere else. You can not, nothing you can get in the world, a house, a car, a bigger house, a bigger car, more expensive vacation, whatever, you're not going to be complete in those things. Those things are fine once you are complete, but you can't use those things to make you complete because they can't do it. Nothing in the world was designed to make you complete. You might have heard that expression, we have a God-shaped hole in our hearts that can only be filled by a relationship with God through Christ. Now, Peter tells us as well in 2 Peter 2, excuse me, 2 Peter 1, verses 2 through 4, that he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. If we're looking for anything other than Jesus to make us complete, we're simply going to be missing it. Now, in verses 5 through 6, we see that we're enriched in all utterance and knowledge. The grace of God could be seen in the lives of the Corinthians by the things that they would say. Does how you speak reflect that you have a relationship with the Lord? I mean, on a very superficial level, you know, what type of expletives do you use? You know, obviously superficial in that way. But how does the way I treat people, you know, verbally... Let's think about that. We're obviously in some circumstances less in contact with people. You know, how do you talk to those people who call you on the phone? Even the scammers. You know, it seems like we get more and more scammers. Could it be that God's allowing that to give you an opportunity to witness to them? Ever think of it that way? Ever think about, Lord, how, why is all this wackiness going on? Lord, opportunity. You know, they could say, well, you really need this. No, you really need Jesus, dude. <laughs> you know? But the way, you know, you can tell a lot about a person's relationship with Jesus by the things that they say in general, and the things they say about him and the things that they don't say. 
You can tell a lot about a person's relationship with their spouse by the way they talk about them. What you re say reflects how well you really know the Lord. And, you know, seriously, when you think about it, what do you find easiest to talk about? Usually the thing you're most interested in, the thing you're most about. Have to admit it, last, last week, didn't drive it here today, but I bought an old Mustang. And I was kind of excited about buying that old Mustang. 2006. It's got his problems, but it's got a V6. You turn on that car, and it's room, you know? And can, the, the danger is, you know, that the, you can see that we have these typical interests, and we, do we tend to talk about those things more than we talk about the Lord, who really, as believers, is our life. It's not just something we have as a tag on our life or as something we have to enjoy during our life. He is our life. So certainly shouldn't, you know, Jesus be the easiest thing to flow off our lips. So then, verse 7, we see that we're enriched in spiritual gifts. The purpose of spiritual gifts is to further demonstrate to the world the reality of a relationship with God. And the reason that Paul's dealing with this specifically with them, as if you know the church in Corinth, they got really into excess on the spiritual gifts, so he had to put it into perspective. As God works in and through our lives in ways that can't be explained naturally, people see the handprint of God. When people look at your life see God, and see God working in your life in some way, that it makes them think, that's why we're called to live a supernatural type of life, dependent on him looking to him, a life of prayer, a life of faith and trust in him, is that other people might see it. Say, hey, there's something different here. One of the most convincing apologetic arguments to the world is a believer filled with and directed by the Holy Spirit. Alan Redpath wrote... That is his way of working, the way in which his sovereign purpose is fulfilled through a people to whom he has made himself known, a people who have enlightenment from the word of God, a people whose very lives demonstrate that, that the God in whom they believe is alive because he dwells within them. God has established, in this sense, a beachhead. He's established a beachhead in Cape Coral. He's established a beachhead in your neighborhood by placing us there and doing his work in our lives by the power of his Holy Spirit. You're called a saint. You're called to be that where you are, where you live, where you work. The church, I know it's not really an organization, but an organism, but you could say the church is, in that sense, a subversive organization. 
because he's called us into the world to be salt and light wherever we are. So that as we're there, as we talk to people, as we affect other people, they see Jesus. I I love it. The greatest picture I see in the book of Acts is when the apostles were called before the Sanhedrin and it says, and they looked at them and saw they were unlearned and uneducated men. But then it says, but they took note that they had been with Jesus. They took, that do people, do people think that when they encounter us? Do they take note? Do they observe? Do they get the impression that we've been with Jesus? And then the last part of verse 7 and verse 8, we see we're enriched as, as we wait for the return of Jesus. As it says, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. God is not finished with us yet. He's going to continue to confirm and establish us till the end. As it says in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will be completing it until the day of Christ Jesus. If you're in him, God's going to continue working on you, conforming you into the image of Jesus until he returns. And then as we see him face to face, the scripture tells us we'll know him as we've been known to be conformed into his image. Because of the work that God is doing in your life, as he's saying that you'll be blameless, no one can make up charges against you. It's not that they won't try, but nothing will stick. Called us to be blameless in him. And the truth of God will be evident in your life. Well, we're going to stop there because I don't want to go too fast through verse 9 because there's a lot in there as well. But the point being is that we're called to know who we are in Christ. That we're called saints. We're called to be set apart for him. We're called to live holy lives. But the only way we can do that is if we're in a relationship with him. If we have personally accepted Jesus Christ as our savior, if we've confessed our sins, repented of our sins, and placed our faith alone in him for our salvation. That's it. That's what makes a saint a saint. And anyone who hasn't done that is an ain't. So... I would encourage you, if anyone, there's anyone here who has not done that afterwards, love to pray with you. We'd love to uh, have any questions. I'd love to speak with you. Um, but for each of us to know who we are, and because of who we are, then how should I then live? Think about that. You know, because as Paul will tell the Corinthians later, it's the love of Christ that constrains or compels me. That's what controls my life is the fact that he loved me to the extent that he went to die for my sins on the cross. That I could have life in him. What does everything else matter in comparison to that? Not a bit. Not a bit compared to that. So that should shape our very lives. So let's pray. 
Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord God. We thank you for who we are in you, Lord. And Lord, that you're working by your spirit in our lives. You've called us saints. But because you've called us to be saints, you're conforming us into your image. And Lord, we're becoming more and more like you. And we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, wherever you have us, whether it be our jobs, homes, schools, whatever, Lord, that you'd use us in those situations. Lord, because this world desperately needs you. It's falling apart without you, Lord. So we thank you for that, Lord, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's